America's Heartland is made possible by the American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, dedicated to building greater awareness and understanding of agriculture through education and engagement. More information at agfoundation.org. Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. The United Soybean Board, whose Common Ground program creates conversations to help consumers get the facts about farming and food. There's more at findourcommonground.com. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KBIE to support America's heartland programming. Contributors include the following. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. We're heading to the Buckeyes today to introduce you to a farm family whose focus in agriculture goes far beyond providing food that lands on your dinner table. Their farm here in Ohio takes a more global approach to providing feed and livestock. Hi, I'm Jason Schultz. Coming up, I'll take you to one of our nation's busiest seaports to see what's being done to protect American agriculture. You may have seen it in the produce section and wondered, what do I do with that? I'm Sharon Vaknin. Stick around and we'll tell you everything you've ever wanted to know about On Beeve. I'm Rob Stewart. We'll head south for a seafood special in Cajun country. We'll take you to Louisiana to a farm bringing in the harvest of colorful and tasty crawfish. That's all coming up next right here on America's Heartland. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's Heartland. And a pride in the brand In America's heartland Living close Close to the land We're in Louisiana where crawfish is king right now. Harvest is in full swing and we're taking you out on the water to see how it's done. On any day between October and June, you're likely to find multiple members of the Benoit family working the fields on their Louisiana farm, calling in a catch of red swamp crawfish. Crawfish really is a way of life here in Louisiana, isn't it? It's a big part of our life, yeah. What would you do without it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've been doing it over 30 years. Crawfish have been harvested in the Bayou State since the 1880s, but real production didn't begin until the 1960s when farmers began reflooding rice fields to encourage a crawfish habitat. We enjoy it, my wife enjoys it, she runs ponds, you can see my grandkids they enjoy it, my son's in it, and hopefully even my younger uh, grandkids are going to get into it. Hurricanes Katrina and Rita in 2005 affected both crawfish production and demand. Yields have rebounded in recent years, cementing Louisiana's position as the number one producer of crawfish in the United States. Using a boat powered by a hydraulic wheel, the Benoits farm a thousand acres, about three hours west of New Orleans. The crawfish are captured in baited pyramid traps, then transferred to 30-pound sacks. On a good day, the family will harvest four to 600 pounds of crawfish. So here's your harvest, Donald. That's a lot of, lot of work out there. It sure is, but we enjoy it. We like to get here early in the morning before the sun gets up and try to get through before it gets too hot. The amount of crawfish they catch depends in part on how much rain falls because the pregnant females bury themselves beneath the soil and only reemerge with their young when the rice fields are reflooded in the fall and winter months. They're going to come back at the end of September, November with young ones on, under the tail. Hopefully they can drill down deep enough to have an adequate water supply where they can stay and stay through a dormancy until we get the right rain in September and October to come up. It's not a perfect crop, uh, mainly because the hard part is you can't see it. It's not like putting a rice seed out there or soybean seed where you can go right there and check on it. But, you know, you find what works for you and, and you just kind of stick with it. 
and uh, hopefully you do well enough to keep everything going. It may be hard work, but the fishing business has already lured Donald's grandson to become a third generation farmer. So tell me about what you hope to bring to this farming operation. I just plan to do what my grandpa does and maybe expand a little bit, just try to make a career out of crawfish farming. Mm -hmm. When you say expand, what do you mean? I mean, maybe appeal more, try to get more business, you know, it's always good to make more money. Mm -hmm. So. And have you, you know, you're going to college, but you have really learned so much. Oh yeah, I've been around the farm all my life. I've been doing this. I couldn't see myself doing anything else. Even younger brother Gavin, who's been doing much of the heavy lifting on this harvest, finds the job to be fun. I enjoy this because you really get to hang out with your family and friends, and it just means a lot to me. The Benoits also rotate crops by planting rice in some of their fields, since the flat, flooded areas work well for both crawfish and rice production. And because rice fields must first be flooded and then drained for harvest, this mimics the cycles of natural watersheds where crawfish can thrive. A lot of crawfish ponds are rotated behind rice. You do rice and you come in with the crawfish. This is a permanent pond which there's going to be no rice planted for harvest. Uh, you know, we're going to clean it up, maybe throw a little green rice in there. I mean by green rice, it's rice you plant in uh, August or September. It's rice just for crawfish, it's not for harvest. After the crop is harvested, it's trucked to a processing plant where the crawfish are ready to be prepared for market. First, they're weighed, then steamed, and peeled. Hundreds of pounds of crawfish tail meat are prepared each day in this one plant alone. In 2010, farmers in the state raised more than 100 million pounds of crawfish, worth $168 million. The finished product is then sealed into one pound bags, where it's shipped to supermarkets, restaurants, and sold to customers. I need three crawfish eggs to pay to go. Locally, the crop becomes the catch of the day at Johnny's Drive-In, where it's served over a bed of rice with a side of fried catfish and all the fixings. All right, everybody, let's eat. You can call them crawfish, crayfish, or mud bugs. There are some 350 varieties of crawfish in the United States. And how's this for patriotic? Crawfish come not only in a red species, but also white and even blue. Many farming operations today are diversified. That's the reality when it comes to turning a profit while turning the soil. For some, it's a combination of crops and livestock. For the Cerber family farm here in Ohio, it's a more global approach to providing feed and livestock. Agricultural roots run deep in the Cerber family, seven generations on this Ohio land. Since 1802, when Jacob Serber first settled the land, we've had a Serber on this farm ever since, and including today. My, I'm here at my father's house, who's 92, and my uncle's behind us baling hay, and he's 89. Raising crops has been a way of life for the Serbers for more than 200 years. But some 20 years ago, the family began to diversify, involving themselves in other agricultural enterprises. A natural offshoot was the purchase of a feed company for which John Serber had long been a sales representative. We buy corn from local farmers and we grind it, we mix it with uh, vitamins and minerals, and then we haul it to the different farms. And you look to see which ones yeah. were hog farms and which one were dairies. Sean Serber is the logistics manager at Premier. Coming behind you, Jeff. Sean supervises the movement of 350 tons of feed each day. This is the computer that makes all of our feed here. It'll draw up each ingredient, dump it into a scale hopper where it's weighed, and then it goes down into our mixer. After that, it's ready to be loaded on a truck. Premier also makes food for pigs. That came in handy when the servers decided to add livestock to the mix. 11 years ago when we bought the business and we were looking for ways to expand, the opportunity to build a pig barn came up and it just seemed like it'd be a good fit because that's what we done. We made feed for animals. The family's pork production operation has grown dramatically. Today, 
totaling some 60,000 pigs a year. From 14-pound piglets, these hogs will grow to 270-pound animals over a six-month period. It's a pork production operation that involves almost everyone, including Sean's daughter, Brooklyn. They're really cute, and you got to work with them to make them not scared so they'll be good mamas with their babies. And in 2010, the family expanded their livestock efforts, becoming certified to export animals overseas. It's a project they call Feed the World. Feed the World is really an offshoot from ultimately what we do is help farmers each and every day, whether it be on our businesses from the feed side, the grain side, or now with raising livestock. So, you know, this is a way that we can not only touch things going on here in Ohio and surrounding states, but now we can actually reach out to the world. Connie, tell me about the isolation facility. This hoop structure um, is part of our Feed the World exports that where we'll bring cattle in and they are required by the country that they'd be traveling to to stay here for a certain amount of days. In this case, these cattle were traveling to Turkey and Turkey is required for the animals to stay here 20 days and they're quarantined. And you say 20 days for Turkey, but depending on the country, it could be any number of days. Yes. And at any one time, you could have anywhere from well, 77 or less to what, up to, you said 300? 300 could stay under this. <laughs> Feed the World currently moves livestock by road, rail, and ship. The creation of an airport inspection station nearby will ultimately allow the servers to fly animals to locations around the globe. Efficiency is one side of it. It's more the speed. Whenever you're going to Turkey or Russia, it's going to take 21 to 28 days by boat. We can do it in 12 to 16 hours. All of these agricultural enterprises provide the servers with the opportunity to continue a farming tradition that's already two centuries old. From an opportunity standpoint, from a satisfaction standpoint, I don't know of any other industry in the world that could be better, and that's really what we all love about what we do each and every day. And I like to say for most people, they get up and they go to work, it's their job, they come home from work. It's not our job, it's our life, and we love our life. Hogs make the list as one of the top five agriculture commodities in Ohio, alongside soybeans, corn, dairy products, and eggs. A male hog, called a boar, can grow to weigh 500 pounds. Oh, and watch what you say about pigs. Unlike some humans, pigs don't overeat. They stop when they're full. I'm Jason Schultz. Still ahead, what's being done at our nation's ports to protect our food supply? I'm Sharon Vackman. Still ahead, it's a vegetable you may not have ever tried, but we'll show you some great ways to enjoy on these. Long grain, white, brown, jasmine, sticky, zesty, Asian, heat and serve. There's lots of different options in your rice aisle these days. And for many folks all around the world, rice is the most important food on their plate. And the difference between white rice and brown rice, it's just a matter of milling. There are many different varieties of rice, but that's not what determines if the rice is white or brown. After the rice is harvested, it ends up getting milled. Less milling, well, you've got brown rice. Mill and polish the grain even more to get white rice. Finely polished rice is used for things like the alcoholic beverage sake. The milling process does remove vitamins and nutrients found on the outer edges of rice grain, but many of those are added back to white rice. That's what enriched means right there on the package. One difference that you might not be aware of, white rice has a longer shelf life. Brown rice will last about six months, but one study found that white rice could last from 25 to 30 years if properly stored. And because rice is a gluten-free product, you'll find its popularity on the rise in all parts of your grocery store. Things like brown rice pasta, rice milk, rice wine, lots of different rice products to take off the shelf. You might have seen endive or endive at the grocery store or farmer's market. 
It's that cabbage-like vegetable that comes in this green and red variety. Well, what is it? How do you cook it? And is it just for salads? I'm here with Richard Collins from CVS, California Vegetable Specialties in Rio Vista, California. Tell me about your farm. Well, we produce endive, not endive. Um, endive is the second growth of a chicory root. The first growth of this chicory root here takes place in the field from seed. It takes about five months. We harvest that from the, the fields. We bring it inside and grow it again in the dark, just like in a mushroom type environment. And this root then, which has the bud on top, grows in the, those dark conditions with mild temperatures and high humidity to produce the actual endive itself. And once we pull the root from cold storage, that clock starts ticking and it's about a four week time frame from day one until harvest of the endive itself. So you can grow endive year round. We never stop. All of this talk about endive is making me so hungry. And today I'm making creamy smoked salmon endive boats and a tangy sauteed endive salad. What you will you be making? You said endive. Is that wrong? Yes. What is there a difference between endive and endive? You've got to say endive because endive is a green head of curly lettuce also in the chicory family. But we don't grow endive, we grow endive. Endive is really versatile in that it not only can be used for nice fresh preparations, but it can be cooked. So we're going to put a little bit of olive oil in this pan and we're just going to give the endive a, a quick pan fry after we simply cut it in half. Okay, we're going to braise some endive now under a medium high heat. We're going to let them brown up, uh, caramelize a little bit on the, the cut surface. Then we're going to turn them over, let them cook a little bit more and then add the braising liquid, in this case chicken stock. The endive has lots and lots of fiber so it does not fall apart when cooked. It just softens up, sugars break down a little bit, it sweetens up a little bit from the caramelization of those sugars. So it's gonna cook now low and slow. We can do it here just with the cover on. All right, the endive is on the stove. How long are we going to keep it there? Uh, a good 25, 30 minutes. Okay, that's perfect because we are making a quick appetizer, creamy smoked salmon endive boats. And to make the boats, we're just going to remove the leaves from the endive core. Let's get started on the creamy part of this dish. We are going to take half an avocado, just scoop out that half directly into a food processor. All right, now we're going to add about eight ounces of creme fraiche, add about a tablespoon of lemon, and I'm also going to use the zest from the lemon. Salt and pepper. 